Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 456 of the podcast and it's Sunday 20th of October 2019 as I record this. I am just back from Frankfurt Book Fair so I'm in that tired phase of introvert recovery when the sort of vibrations of all the people and all the noise and all the overstimulation of books are uh, just starting to um, sort of sink down a bit and I slept loads last night just recovering but um, more on Frankfurt in my personal update coming soon. So today I'm talking to Michael Andelay about his journey from indie author to running a creative empire in about five years. Now, many of you will know the 20 books to 50k group uh, that Michael started, and it is pretty much focused on writing fast, writing genre fiction in series and using KU. Uh, So it is very focused on one particular business model that some authors have. And it's quite different to my own model, which is more multiple streams of income, multiple genres, not writing that far, still writing reasonably well, uh, productively, but uh, not certainly not writing a book a month. And my own model, of course, is wide. Uh, it's, yeah, as I said, globally focused, whereas the 20 books to 50K is very much US English speaking market. So when I found out that Michael um, is going wide with his next series, I wanted to have a chat because this is quite a significant shift. Now, earlier in the year, um, Michael did announce going wide with audio, and I mentioned that on the podcast, but going wide with ebooks as well as print and audio, this is a big shift. Now, I know, as since I've been doing this over a decade, most indies will eventually go wide um, because of many reasons. Uh, you know, maybe they want to make an impact on a bigger scale, they want to reach readers outside of KU because most readers on the planet do not have access to KU, let alone actually just reading KU. So uh, I think this will be very interesting. However long, uh, you know, wherever you are on your author journey, I think you will find this interesting. So uh, because there's there's kind of advice for all different levels of authors here. And certainly uh, I still disagree with Michael on many things, but um, we've hung out together recently and uh, we agree on on the big stuff, I think, uh, just not the <laughs> some of the smaller, smaller things. But I certainly will want to be having him back on the show to talk about what he's learned because going wide at this point with such a backlist is uh, going to be interesting. He's going... He's going wide with a new series, uh, so he's not kind of impacting his existing market, his existing series on KU. But this is interesting. We also talk about uh, intellectual property and how he works with co-writers, because that's quite different as well. Not something I do uh, in that model. So um, that is coming up. In publishing and book marketing news this week, Jane Friedman reports on current trends in traditional publishing. And uh, obviously, uh, we're all still interested in that. We all still love publishing and and books in every way. But according to reports from BookScan, after six years of growth, the print market for traditional publishers has started to decline. High profit High profile titles drove growth in 2018, while backlist gained market share, squeezing the mid list. Um, political fatigue is setting in, <laughs> which I'm laughing about as this weekend, as I speak, we are still going through Brexit fun. Um, but lifestyle themes like Marie Kondo and tidying up remain strong. And actually, I was just reading an article about the um, the growth in these cleaning books and cleaning Instagram channels uh, like Hint Yourself Happy and stuff like that, which I just find weird because I, you know, I like having a clean home, but I like paying someone to do it <laughs> while I do other things. I, I'm just not someone who finds cleaning to be uh, therapeutic, but I know a lot of people do. And it was interesting because this article said the focus on cleaning and organising is a lot to do with how chaotic the rest of the world feels right now. If you can at least organise your cupboards at home, you feel more in control of your life. It was actually a really fascinating article about why people want to 
organise things. And it makes sense, again, political environment. Uh, So yeah, if you are doing books about cleaning and organising and that type of thing, then then cool, basically. Uh, what else did Jane say? While print sales are roughly flat, the ebook market for traditional publishers has declined every year since 2014. The market has remained stable in part because of the growth of digital audio, which I'll be talking about more. Um, audio, just fun, fun, fun everywhere. But it's interesting it's saying that print market for traditional publishers has started to decline. I think that's possibly because people are buying more print online in the same way that people, you know, buying ebooks online, that means indies can take a percentage of that um, market share. Uh, trends in adult fiction, the current med- reader mood, escape combined with nostalgia. Uh, and that nostalgia element, I've seen that everywhere recently, this sort of harking back to older days. Again, part of a potentially troubled, um, the other side of that is dystopian, which of course everyone's still loving. Uh, they also talked about um, a hunger, a curiosity, an urgency for readers to understand and experience point of views that are not their own. And this is part of the idea of having more diversity in publishing too. I think this is brilliant. This is what I'm, I guess I'm trying to do also with books and travel, which is interview people about their perspective on other places. So this very memoirish side of things, I think, is is growing. Uh, Jane also says, the panel expressed with a very apologetic tone that authors are more responsible than ever for marketing. We do look to our authors to be the best marketing person for their book. And that, um, that is basically traditional publishing. That is, So it's not just indies. <laughs> I know that many people think, oh, if I could only get a traditional publishing deal, I would never have to do any marketing again. But it's not true. (laughs) So that is on Jane Friedman's blog um, at janefriedman.com. Links in the show notes. Much more than that. I just picked a few things out. Uh, Also, um, Jane reports every two weeks in the hot sheet, which you can find at hotsheetpub.com. And I get a lot from that newsletter. Um, She writes it with Porter Anderson from Publishing Perspectives. It is an excellent newsletter, mainly focused on the US market, because Jane is in the US, um, with some UK, other English speaking territories. Uh, But also this week, really great, the new publishing standard have launched a newsletter focused on global publishing. And you can find that at streetlib.com forward slash publish global. Again, I'll link to both of those in the show notes. And the need for curation is greater than ever in a world where there's so much news. And obviously, I pick some of this every week for you guys to share on the podcast. But these newsletters are always full of a lot more stuff. So that's the hot sheet. um, And also streetlib.com forward slash publish global. And then this is kind of crossover between publishing and writing and futurist news. Uh, But Google has announced a new voice recorder app that transcribes in real time, even when you're offline. So this is the first one because everything else works with internet and cloud-based transcription. This is only for Android, which is really annoying, but it is fantastic. I've had a look at it. People are saying it's game changing. And the dictation and transcription market has basically gone to zero. Um, This is obviously um, free. It's native in Pixel 4 the Pixel 4 phone uh, with no timeline for other devices, but fingers crossed for iOS. But also, like, I've just been using... um, even just into things or texting, whatever, on on Apple. And there are lots of apps now you can use and you can just use the little microphone button for dictating into. So, um, you know, there is still Dragon for dictation and for transcription, but you have to pay for that. And what I think has happened is that all this AI uh, voice analysis is just bringing down the cost to basically free. So if you haven't tried dictation yet or transcription of existing voice material, very good idea to try it um, these days, given all of these opportunities. So this was reported in TechCrunch. Um, You can use the phone in airplane mode and it still works. It also, and this is brilliant, it has advanced search functionality, which will take you to a specific place in the recording. All good news for audio content. As I've talked about, I use Descript.com at this point. um, And there are just lots of options now. So yeah, interesting times. 
So in my personal update this week, Frankfurt Book Fair in Germany, if you didn't know where Frankfurt is. So I went uh, to the fair because I have three books coming out in German in mid-November. If you remember, I I use Deep L, uh, Deep letter L.com, Deeple.com um, to do AI transcription of the first draft. And then I've used German editors and uh, beta readers. Thank you, my wonderful audience who have done that. They are up for pre-order right now. They're basically the German editions of Successful Self-Publishing, which has been adapted to the German situation. Um, The Successful Author Mindset and How to Make a Living with Your Writing. Those three books, which are all reasonably short, And so they're coming out and I wanted to meet up with German indies and German podcasters. And so thanks to everyone I was able to meet and have a chat with and some selfies with. And it was great. Uh, It was great to meet so many people and just to bump into people as well as I walked around. Uh, Too many people to name everyone, but thank you. You know who you are. Uh, It was definitely great to go again. I went to Frankfurt in 2014 and things have changed a lot. So to put this in perspective, Frankfurt is the pretty much the largest book fair in the world and it is a rights market. So publishers from all over the world go to Frankfurt in order to license the rights to books and so that they can publish them in their own territory, their own language. Um, and it's, it's like a showcase. There are all these booths of from publishers and also they have a wonderful uh, expansion of books into things like gin and wine. And uh, there's a massive audio stage. There's things like calendars and stationery and the academic presses are there and the children's presses. And I mean, it's massive. It, it's huge. You you know, I think I walked between 20 and 30,000 steps every day just walking around the areas. Um, and that's not even just walking back to the hotel and stuff. So it's a very significant place for traditional publishing. But what's interesting, back in 2014, when I went, I felt like there was no place for indies. I mean, it was a very early days of indies in Germany, but... Um, I didn't feel very welcome back then. And certainly things have changed so much. Uh, it This time when I went, I walked into one of the halls, uh, Hall 3, and down this kind of alley. It wasn't an alley. It's just the side of one of the main uh, halls. And there were all these genre fiction booths with indie author collectives, uh, mainly romance and fantasy which is where it always starts. So the genre fiction authors are always the first to run with indie because they are the ones who have the most underserved market, um, particularly in those markets where traditional publishing still gatekeeps what they think people should read. Uh, And Germany's certainly one of those markets. So romance, fantasy, there are some beautiful covers there, very impressive uh, artwork and um, merchandise and there were author talks and there were meet and greets and um, you can actually sell things at the Frankfurt Book Fair and you can actually meet with readers which is not really what London is about for example. Uh, There were new publishers who've sprung out of the indie movement there was an author stage with lots of talks. KDP also had a stage and uh, Matthias Matting from the self-publishing Beeble.de he's the kind of he was one of the first people in uh, indie in Germany and they had lots of other indie authors speaking. So basically, I just felt like, wow, this is brilliant. And it felt like 2012 in America. So many of you will not remember the halcyon days of 2012, but it was it was just like this. It felt like, oh, my goodness, this is so new. There's loads of opportunity, but the traditional industry is still ignoring us. But it doesn't matter because we're just doing it. And it, it was very empowering. I and I was I kind of caught this flame of excitement. And I I wanted to say like so often we can feel like things have moved on so far in the English speaking markets and we think like, oh my goodness, everything's already happened. I'm late to come in. Um but actually <laughs> most well all the other languages, pretty much all the other languages um, uh, are only just getting started or haven't even heard about this yet. And they don't have the tools that we do. In fact, even in the UK, we don't have the tools that a lot of people do have in America. For example, Authors Direct on Findaway Voices is still US. Um, 
Chirp by BookBub, still US. Uh, so there are things that, you know, people can't do in different markets. I mean, the reason that many people can't even self-publish is that they can't access, um, you know, they can't use bank accounts uh, that places like Amazon allow. Uh, so, you know, companies like Smashwords, draft a digital Publish Drive, you know, they can pay in different ways. But we're still in this era where it is not fair internationally. And but what's happening is things have just started to take off. So I'm very, I was very, very excited uh, about meeting some of the people. And uh, what I did, what, what was lovely, um, oh, actually, I did write down some names. Thanks to Henry, Alison, Julia and Julia, uh, Claudia, Matthias, Ingrid, Lawrence, Mike and Judith, Steve and Steve. Yes, for great chats. And I also met up with longtime listener of the show and frequent commenter on my blog, Marion Hill, author of the Cambia fantasy series, who had flown over from San Antonio, Texas to attend the fair. And I asked Marion why he attended Frankfurt this year. I've always wanted to come. It's kind of been a bucket list item for me. But but in overall, I want to learn more about the publishing world outside of America. I think we, we tend to be, as Americans, kind of American-centric. And coming here made me realize that international publishing is a big deal. And just realize the, the massive scope and size of it that is just really... You now I'm just coming here to learn more than anything, not trying to pawn off my books or anything like that, but just to learn about and just experience it for the first time. So it was lovely to meet up with Marion and also to have, you know, an American indie author getting this overview of an international publishing market, which really, I think, blew his mind. So in terms of what might be useful to you listeners from what I learned at the fair, uh, obviously, in the last couple of weeks, um, there have been ads introduced for the German store, the DE store, through the KDP dashboard and also for the UK. So if you self-publish on Amazon KDP and you go into um, promote and advertise the book, you will be able to do a drop down on US store, UK store or German store. And of course, what's happened in the UK and Germany, because a number of the authors said uh, to me, is that there has been a jump in ad cost since the beginning of October because of increased competition. And I wanted to remind all those American indies who have jumped into the UK and German stores that remember... <laughs> We price our books in different uh, currencies. And if you're just moving over your same um, pay-per-click price from US dollars, uh, make sure you do an adjustment for GBP and euro. Because, for example, if my book is $4.99 in the US, it's a, it might be £2.99 uh, and it might be €3.99. So, of course, I can't afford to have the same advertising price on a GBP book than I can on a US dollar. So I think a lot of these ad prices have just gone so high because American authors uh, have not translated the price particularly. So check your bids because they might be just mighty high and that will affect your profits. Uh, also, I think what has happened in Germany is that um, these ads and also the fact that more German readers are buying books online. So I decided to get back into this because last year, 7% of my book sales were to the German market in English. So I decided to start serving the German market with German books. Um, but interestingly, so a number of people uh, have asked why I haven't done this before. Well, I did do this before. Back in 2014, I did self lots of self-publishing in translation. It was the early days of people getting into translation. I did two novels in German, one self-published, one with a digital imprint, Ulstein Midnight, uh, which was a crime imprint, a traditional deal. Um, neither one sold very well. And that is because I think at the time, uh, German readers were not necessarily buying books online very much. And also there were very few ways to market to that to German readers if you weren't in Germany and speaking German. I also did Italian and Spanish at the same time. They didn't work either. <laughs> and again, the main, uh, the main issue was the inability to market easily and a lack of readers in a digital first market things are starting to change. But what I would suggest is that um, when, if you're thinking of translation, it really is about how how can you market to that readership? And if you can't market, then you may not get your money back. That's how I feel. 
Now, this is a, an interesting point as well, given my discussion with Michael. But a number of German indies said they had tried going wide and it was basically impossible. Um, for ebooks, the Tolino is diff- more difficult to market on. Um, with print, uh, going wide with print, many German bookstores wouldn't buy from the Ingram catalogue, so they needed to be with other services, um, which might charge more money. Uh, and interest. So basically, they are mainly, um, the German indies are uh, going direct and exclusive. So I am going to do that with KDP Select for my German ebooks and for my print books initially. And then if I can get an ACX royalty share deal for the successful author mindset in audio, that will also be exclusive. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because of this marketing reason. I tried going wide in German. And the point is, I'm, I love publishing wide in English because I know this podcast goes out what has been downloaded in 218 countries. If I didn't publish wide, you would not be able to buy my books in your countries. But in German language, I have no way to market in German because I don't speak German. So I think this is now going to be my philosophy until I see other ways of marketing. If I go into KDP Select for German, I can use um, promotional tactics that do not require me to speak (laughs) or email or any of those other things that we use for wide marketing. If you speak German, then you might be able to do a lot more than I can. Um, So I think that's important. So yeah, this is quite different for me. But um, like I said, I failed miserably in 2014 and it cost me money. So this time I'm quite determined to um, get my money back at least. (laughs) If you read German and would like an advanced copy of any of my German books, please email joanna at thecreativepen.com. And if you are a German language audiobook narrator or know anyone and who might be interested in working with me, please email. I will be doing a solo show on all my lessons learned about publishing and marketing in German later uh, before Christmas. Right. I also went to the Audio Summit, which was a special ticketed event about audiobooks, lots of people speaking. And I think in a way it was quite shocking because I've just been saying, you know, with ebooks and things, other countries are just getting started. But what they were talking about is audiobooks in the English language have 60 years of history now with an established ecosystem of narrators, content production, listeners who've graduated from cassettes to CDs to digital and bookstores that have stocked audiobooks. But in other markets, they are starting from scratch. And speakers from Latin America and Africa particularly spoke of a strong oral storytelling tradition, but they say they're at day one in terms of producing and selling audiobooks in local voices, local stories, but even, you know, bigger books in local languages. Um, Even in English, the speaker from Aku Books in Ghana mentioned that she wants African English stories and African English narrators, which are very hard to find. And selling audiobooks in Africa is only just getting started with Streetlib, who are fantastic for focusing on all these developing markets. So if you want to know more about the African market or Latin America, all the other territories, subscribe to that um, new email list at the uh, New Publishing Standard, uh, which you can find at the new publishing standard.com or the email was at streetlib.com forward slash publish global. So yeah, that was interesting. Other underserved markets include Spanish language um, in Latin, Mer- Latin America, but also in the USA. If you are a Latino indie, now seems to be a great time to get into audio. And in fact, I'd love to talk to um, to know more about the Latino indie community. I know I'm very aware of a strong African-American community now, um, but I, I haven't met many people from a Latino indie community. So would love to know more about that. You can always email me or tweet me at The Creative Pen and tell me where um, the Latino indies are. So all these markets Look, these developing markets look like they're going to go to mobile first and digital subscription first. So Storytel is getting into these markets. These are leapfrog technologies. So these markets are skipping, you know, a lot of people don't have access to physical books or easy access. And um, they're not reading ebooks, but they're moving from 
basically listening to radio to maybe moving to listening to audiobooks. Um, so it's so funny because back in the day, you know, we used to think that ebooks would disrupt print, but actually it looks like audiobooks will disrupt print. <laughs> <laughs> and one speaker even said that the audio summit was the happiest room at the fair, implying that um, nowhere else had the double digit and even triple digit growth that audio does. I had to wait until the last 10 minutes when someone finally talked about AI voices. Um, the English speaking market uh, companies, I'm sure you can guess their names, said they wouldn't use it um, because they want to honour the voice in the author's head, which I thought was very nice sentiment. But um, to be fair, we again, we have this massive backlist, hundreds of thousands of audiobooks, whereas for the developing markets, they said they would definitely consider AI voices because they have so little content and such, you know, no ecosystem. So if you want to take a market from... 50 books or 400 books to thousands of books, hundreds of thousands of books, you need a faster method of production than trying to find all the narrators, trying to record all those books. So this was very interesting to me. It makes me think that perhaps AI voices for non-English will become much bigger before AI voices for English. So for example, given there's so few audiobooks in, uh, say, Colombia, uh, could you use a um, uh, an AI to read your book in Spanish and put it out on one of these sites or even YouTube? I mean, if you don't want to sell it, you could use it for some kind of marketing. I mean, seriously, I'm thinking about this. Like, would that be an interesting thing to do? I don't know. I'm really, I was just sitting there going, wow, this is this is just so totally different to the English speaking market. How can we help people uh, to find more content when it's just not available right now? And again, harking back to the early days of indie, uh, in 2009, the people who just put stuff onto the Kindle, they were the ones who reaped the benefit. They might not have been the best books, but there was so little content that anyone putting stuff up got read a lot. So I kind of think this is a similar situation. Uh, just a couple more things. I know I'm going on a bit, um, but I also went to a presentation by Amazon Crossing, which was great. They were focused on authors like no other session I went to. I mean, seriously, you've got to love a pub, um, Amazon Publishing, they really do focus on their authors and they just kept talking about their authors. They were great. Uh, they did announce a link where you can submit books for consideration for translation or recommend books from authors. So if you are reading a book in another language and you think this would be great to be translated, go to translation.amazon.com forward slash submissions. And I'll put that link in the show notes as well. I also went to a session on blockchain for publishing, which was great. And I came away with the, with the impression that this might actually be feasible in 2020 after talking about it for years now. <laughs> I talked to the guys at bookchain.ca who have a contract, sorry, who have a solution <laughs> with smart contracts that will enable payments to collaborators, but will also enable resale of ebooks, which I think is brilliant because the reason, well, there's a few reasons we don't have resale of ebooks, but if the money can flow back to the original creator through blockchain um, technology, then that is fantastic. And they're also focusing on the use of normal currency for buying books and paying authors, which is really better than crypto and will mean that the mainstream adopt it faster. So you can check them out, bookchain.ca. They really only launched this year, so they're in beta and everything. But when I listened to their presentation, I just thought this is becoming much more mature now and uh, hopefully will become part of our selling direct possibilities in 2020. So yeah, just to round up, uh, really enjoyed Frankfurt. We'll most likely be going back again next year. Might even have a booth, might have a meetup. Uh, really thinking about that because I'm always just inspired and reinvigorated by a global perspective. It just makes me 
thrilled to be a tiny, tiny part of a massive publishing ecosystem. I always learn a lot. I, um, you know, I, I feel so often, especially in the position I'm in, where I you know, I talk to so many people in the in the industry. This is my job. This is what I do. And it feels like in our echo chamber, everyone's an author. Everyone's doing all this stuff. Everyone knows what we're talking about. But <laughs> Seriously, it's only just beginning in some markets. And so I hope that's encouraged you as well. Don't think you are late to the party. There is so much more to go. So thanks for all your emails and tweets uh, in the last week. I am, I'm actually not going to read any today because I know I've been going on too long, but thank you to everyone uh, for all of that. Um, today's show is sponsored by draft to digital and of course, draft to digital support wide publishing and audio and everything. And I'll play a word from the lovely Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. Uh, and of course, you can get into libraries through draft to digital which I think is hugely important. If you're publishing wide, you get your eBooks and audiobooks into libraries, um, which I love. And of course, print if they order them, but much easier to get paper checkout, digital ebooks and audio in libraries. And just a reminder, you can get my books in your library. Just go in and ask um, and you should be able to get them. Uh, this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Uh, so thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. Thanks to everyone who supported me for years and months. And also thank you to new patrons, Megan Martin, Jill Grimes or Gil Grimes, Jesse Jones Wilbanks. Scott Stroud and Judy M. Baker. I really appreciate your support on Patreon. Like the tweets and emails, it demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. And you can support the show with just a couple of dollars a month, uh, less than a coffee a month, and you will get the backlist Q&A extras. And I recorded October's Q&A last week. So if you support the show, you will get that extra audio. It's about 45 minutes of extra audio a month where I answer questions from patrons. So you can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from draft digital and then we'll get into the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Thompson with draft digital bringing you D2D smart author tip number eight. Libraries. Did you know that public libraries in the U.S. alone get around 1.5 billion visits per year? We've spent a lot of time building and growing our library distribution because we really believe libraries are a big deal. Greater discoverability, good word of mouth, higher potential royalties, there's a lot to love. Plus, you know, good karma. D2D can get your books into more than 40,000 libraries in 70 plus countries worldwide. And all it takes is checking a couple of boxes. Start reaching a bigger audience now. Convert your manuscript, distribute it online, and get support the whole way at drafttodigital.com slash pen. Sign up now and get a free author marketing guide, drafttodigital.com slash pen. Happy writing. Michael Andley is the award-nominated, internationally best-selling author of more than 40 urban fantasy and science fiction novels. He's also the co-author of many more, with authors under his company LMVPN Publishing, which has now sold over 3 million books. Michael is also the co-founder of the popular 20 Books to 50K Facebook group and events with Craig Martell. So welcome, Michael. How are you doing? Pleasure to be here, Joanna. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Obviously, after so long, we we met several years ago and several times since. So lovely to have you on the podcast. Likewise, it is always fun to come on to the podcast that uh, I listen to as a, a fish, a newbie, so to speak. And the creative pen was always there from the beginning. <laughs> yes, we might come back to the fish because I think that's te- that those terms are in the Facebook group, aren't they? But may not be so widely known uh, out there. So we'll come back to that. But I want to wind back because uh, you have an extraordinary business now. But I want to know, what did you do before 2015 when you started self-publishing? And, you know, ha- why books? Why get into this in the first place? Well, I had an online and offline sales marketing consulting company where I would integrate, you know, offline sales and I could be salespeople that needed to, you know, work with companies and then the online components that were necessary. So I might do websites, but then I might do a website that was relevant to explaining 
some things like frequently asked questions. When you have a large enterprise company where their salespeople are $200 an hour, you don't want someone asking them the simple things. You want them asking questions that are going to close the job. So that was kind of what my company supported back at that time. Mm. And then what it, you know, why come into it? Well, I'd been a lifelong reader. So, you know, reading has always been my hobby, my gateway to even, you know, trying to keep my head on straight when you have kids all screaming and you finally get them to bed. You just need to relax. And reading's always been there for me. Yeah, and I love that. And I know you're very reader focused, um, which is fantastic. So let's talk about that. And obviously, then you talked about you're, you're from a business background. And I think that is very pertinent to where you are now. And me, me too. You know, we both come from consulting. Um, I think that does help uh, the business of books. But let's come to the idea of 20 books to 50K, because you know, the the term is bandied around now as kind of a group, but it has a genesis in an actual business model. So can you explain, you know, how that idea came to you and why is it so different to the traditional publishing model? Yeah. So one, one thing to understand is that I had no understanding of the, the indie publishing model when I started releasing my books because I didn't pay attention to anybody. I didn't even stop to consider that there would be an infrastructure for it. So I had released two books in November of 2015 and was in Cabo, San Lucas, Mexico. Down there, I was realizing that I was starting to make 12 to $15 a day from these two books. And so for my consulting background, of course, I pull up Microsoft Excel and then I start figuring out what's going on. But down in Mexico, you can have an incredible life, even in Cabo, which is more expensive, for $50,000 a year. Now, you only have to make $36,000 in order to stay in the country. And I looked at it and I said, okay, if I could get 20 books, all making this seven and a half dollars a day that I was making at that time, I could make $50,000 a year and retire my wife, who was, you know, basically the main breadwinner in the company at the time or in the household. And so that's kind of where the genesis was 20 books to make 50K. I had made, you know, I had written two books. I was in the middle of my third in one month. I figured I could finish it by the end of next year. So 2016, so approximately 14 months. And that was my goal. Tried to get, to, you know, 20 books, all making seven and a half dollars and making an income for us. Which, so. yeah, which, it, and it's so, it's so funny because it's so simple. And yet many people um, sort of go 20 books how do I even write 20 books? There are many traditionally published authors who will never write 20 books. <laughs> so I, I'm just interested in how you got over or w whether it even ever came up to you that 20 books was a lot. And obviously you've gone way beyond that now. But and pe for people listening who might consider that to be just, um, you know, so far away from where they are, how, how, how do you take it piece by piece? You know, it's interesting. I've never really considered why I didn't consider it a big deal. But partly is I was a programmer for a lot of years in my life. And as a programmer, you have to write a lot of code every day. So typing a lot is not a big deal. You know, I've written half a million lines of code um, probably in my life. And so writing the books just wasn't there. Now, I had come off of like four or five months of not having much creative uh, issues in my life. So my company uh, pre build uh, my clients so that at that time it's like, if you want me for January, I'm already building you in the beginning of January. If you don't use me, I'm going to bill you for February. <laughs> <laughs> so at that moment, um, some of my clients were going through a, a huge internal. So for two or three months, they didn't need my services. And so I just used that creative juice, that energy that I would have been using on their projects into my own and wrote really fast. I figured I only had a couple of months that they weren't going to need me. So why not try to put it all in there? As a whale reader, something that um, I kind of coined based on whale gamblers, I knew that I didn't want at least, I wanted at least three books before I did any advertising, which I knew how to do because I had the sales and consulting company. So from that perspective, I, I wrote really hard. I didn't have much time. I needed to get these books out. It didn't seem like a big deal to me at the time. And some people need to realize I write pulp fiction. I write space operas. I don't write really convoluted, complex stories that I have to go research a lot for. They just come out of my mind. So I think sometimes people miss that facet of what's going on. 
Mm. And I love this. I mean, the term Pulp Fiction, uh, I think, is now being used with pride in the mm -hmm. indie mm -hmm. community. But I still hear from traditional published authors and or many indie authors who choose to write different types of books. Uh, and every way is valid. We are in no way saying that any way is more valid than another. But when you inevitably, inevitably come up against the issues of quality, um, what do you, what's your response? Um, I, I, <laughs> I tend to be a little bit, uh, a very Texan and for us in, in America, Texan means that I'm willing to, to stand up to anything and say what's going on here because at the end of the day, I don't care about awards. I don't care about best-selling lists. I care if my readers want to reread my stories and am I making money? And if I'm doing those two things, the quality of my books are for, are far superior than perhaps some in my opinion, once again, this is a subjective opinion, than another one that maybe has garnered awards and never sold 2,000 copies. Yeah, yeah, because exactly. <laughs> Which is true. And also, maybe you could reference the whale readers as, as well in that and, and who they are. All right. So I coined whale readers to try to explain to some of the early people I was talking to, you know, as this is a person who reads at least one book a week. You know, here in America, they have this statistic that says so many people don't read even one book a year or four books a year. And I never understood who those people were, but that's fine. You know, I was always reading if, if I had a weekend to myself, which at the time we had high school kids in the house and I could get four or five books going. I was happy. I would just sit there and, and go through four or five books in a weekend. And I realized that was slow now because there are romance readers who read two or three books a day all week long. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we happened to, you know, in our family, we enjoy going to Las Vegas. It's a gambling place. And there's a term called a whale gambler, which I'm never there, but it's someone who can drop a whole bunch of money in a weekend. And so I just kind of said, OK, well, a whale reader is that same concept. It's a person who can sit down and just read a bunch of books. Mm. Well, I'm I'm a whale reader for sure. I mean, I think yeah, I I just buy books all the time. <laughs> I'm just always mm -hmm. buying books. Bye bye bye. <laughs> love them. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I I love that you come from that reader perspective. I think it's it's so important because you know I know how it is when you start to make money and become known for someone who's making you know, some money and has a business, but, you know, you come out of the creative side, um, which, which I love. But on that, um, you basically started this as a side hustle, uh, next to your, um, sales and mm -hmm. marketing job. When did things change in your head to, Oh, this is a business. <laughs> I guess I always went at it as a business because that was just my mindset. But when I guess perhaps to clarify, when did I think it was a viable business was um, at the end of the second month when I went from $380, let's call it, in my first month where I'd released three books. And then the second month, December, I released a fourth. And instead of doing um, like $50, $60 a day, all of a sudden I was at $100, $150, $200. And then, of course, January, we went over five figures or I went over five figures in January. And all of a sudden, it's like, hey, this is a six figure business. This is doing better in 90 days than my consulting business was doing after a couple of years. And of course, I love the idea of making money while I'm sleeping. Oh, yeah, we all do. But again, I think um, we do have a lot of traditionally published authors who listen to the show and people who still consider the traditional publishing model. When people mm -hmm. hear um, $7.50 a day, which is where you started, or 12 to $15 a day, even $100 a day, when people think that if they sign with a traditional publisher, they might get a lump sum, maybe that's two grand, maybe that's five grand, maybe if they're lucky, it's more than that, um, mm -hmm. 10, 20 or whatever. So the model of traditional publishing is more like a spike income. And indie is this, you know, as you say, making money while you sleep, you can log on and kind of see that money's come in. So, ha but you're used, to, you're used to a business and, uh, you know, in your old, old business where money was different. So, ha and you've talked to a lot of authors. So how can people shift that mindset to looking at smaller amounts per day, um, being just, or even more effective than, than big lump sums? I like to use the term 2750, $27 and 50 cents. If I can get someone to just look at that number and say, okay, if you can make $27.50 a day, what is that over a year? And the answer is 
a lot of people will bandy about that the typical average author now doesn't make five thousand dollars a year, but if you can make twenty seven fifty a day, you've just doubled the average. Now let's take it one step further. Let's go to two hundred seventy five dollars a day, which can be one book, if you know one, one real really well selling book, or it can be half a dozen books. But if you can do that, you've just now become a six figure author. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, 2,750 is a seven figure author in a day. And so if I can just get people to look at that one number of 2,750 and go, that's your goal. That's your first goal. And it can be $2.75 for all that matters, right? Oh, yeah. Because that's a thousand a year. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I often say to people, I have a similar thing and I say $10. Um, it doesn't matter if you, you know, if you can get, if you can make $10 from someone who doesn't know you. <laughs> By selling Mm -hmm. your book or selling something online, it kind of changes your mindset. But I think the empowerment of doing that, you kind of have to do it to realize it, right? You you know, if you You don't hit the button, yeah, you have to do like self publish something and make just a couple of dollars to understand the model. So that's a big encouragement for people listening. But let's fast forward to now. Um, So uh, 2019, September 2019, as we talk, um, and now LMBPN publishing. Um, you did br- retire your wife, as you said, or actually you, you broke your wife out, Ju- Judith, and now she's in- <laughs> she's incredible. I'm jealous. I want a Judith, basically. <laughs> so tell us what what does the company look like now, and what is how has your role changed? Oh my goodness, that's uh, a, um, I will try to shorten this question. I have now become the chief executive, so CEO, but also the chief creative officer, where almost all creative concepts and stories and, and um, titles that we're going to do come through me. Anything that's not English, so if it's German, if it's Spanish, if it, whatever, if it's agenting, that tends to go through Judith now. She has a background in law. She has a JD, um, speaks four languages, and has traveled the world many times. So it seemed like an appropriate way to do things. But the the long story, which we can do some other time, is I thought she would want to come into the company. I had no idea that when she retired, that was like, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> So I had uh, there was other situations when she first stepped out of the other company when she was considering, you know, someone else like staying in the industry she had been in for 20 years. You know, I didn't I didn't think about the fact that she have would have an affinity for staying there where she had people she knew for decades. Right. It, it seems obvious in hindsight. So all of a sudden I'm doing a song and dance and tapping going, no, 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 don't go do that. That's, that's just the, the, the glitter. Come over here. You want to come to the small little group that you've never done before. <laughs> that didn't really sound that good. <laughs> so it, 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 it took a while for me to um, get her to come over and uh, consider working with LMBPN, but I'm really glad that she did. We well, should that, all have a Judith. Oh, oh, yeah. As I said, I'm super jealous. But and it's so funny because I did the same thing with my husband. He left his job in 2015, and I just thought, oh, he'll just take on all the stuff that I don't want to do. <laughs> and unsurprisingly, mm-hmm. he wasn't. He wasn't really into a lot of that stuff. So over the years, his role has changed as well. Um, but um, it, it is interesting working with your spouse for sure. But as you say, that is another discussion. But I do um, just to give us a sense of the size of LMBPN. Like, how many books have you got out, and how many authors are you working with? Okay. Like, how does it? How is it right now? Right now, we have in excess of 600 titles that we've produced. We have over 200 audio productions that we, LMBPN, have produced, and we've uh, licensed another 100 in the last 120 days. Um, so we're, we're rapidly both uh, uh, putting that IP of the audio out to other companies, such as Podium or Dreamscape is probably our major, and then Tantor. And then we are... Um, now taking IP and publishing other people, whereas before, for the first three years, we had only ever produced our own IP. And so now we're actually bringing authors in, republishing their backlists, and going forward with their front lists. So that's pretty significant. Steve Campbell, Stephen Campbell is the VP of Operations and Audio. He handles a lot of that infrastructure. Lynn Stigler is on our editing side. We have probably three to four artists that we keep busy all of the time, um, producing 15 to 25 uh, titles a month. Wow. It, it is incredible how you've grown like that. And and it's funny because over the years, I've tried to decide what to do. And um, I made a, a big decision. Like, I feel like I'm much, I, well, it's funny because I feel like we have a lot in common, but I also think I'm 
much more of a control freak than you because I find co-writing incredibly yeah. difficult and you co-write with so many people. So what? How, how have you gone about all of that co-writing? As you say, you're more of a creative producer, like the James Patterson model, I guess. Mm-hmm. You, there's no way you could possibly oversee so many books personally uh, in detail. So how have you done that? Or is that just you, your natural personality? A great question. So in 2016, I started doing collaborations because the fans wanted stories in the Cthulhuian Gambit universe I wasn't going to write. Not only because I didn't have the time, which was partially true, it, well, a lot true, but they wanted stories in areas I had no interest in writing post apocalyptic Earth. I had no interest in writing something about post apoc. So I had reached out to Craig Martell and brought him in. Um, Justin Sloan had reached out to me. And so we spoke about what was going on. So we had like three or four, we had four collaborations and I had done some collaborations with, um, some of my fans to get them started. So we had this infrastructure, but from the business background, it was obvious that if I wanted to grow the publishing side, which is what interests me more than the writing side, that I needed to have people that could then take what I taught them and then they could oversee the next generation, if you will, of the collaborations. And that's so in Curthier and Gambit, we called them age runners, the age of expansion, as an example, which is the sci-fi side of things. Craig Martell took over, and so he herded and received a piece of the action for those series that were within his milieu. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's like you have these, show, they say, call them showrunners, like Craig and his mm-hmm. universe, and other people write in his universe, and he directs that, and you you kind of sit above all of them and make sure it all works, although your story Bibles must be huge at this point. <laughs> Uh, you know what? The fans are the ones who <laughs> helped keep those early story things together. The JIT readers. It's fascinating how the story that the fans can read the stories and get more detail out of it than us as authors can possibly remember. And so they're the ones who actually helped keep us on track for <laughs> the first two years. And then you had like a, we built a second um, universe, Oris Saren with Martha Carr. And so, you know, we had Cartherian Gambit going and then we had Oris Saren going. And because of the success of Cartherian, people wanted to join us on the Oris Saren side, even though we had no sales um, history to show anything about it. And so just from there, it was a constant, you know, keeping what's going on. So getting our editing, making sure it's, it's on, ta- on track. And, you know, we don't, or at least I don't accept what everybody tells me can be done. So, you know, editing in the beginning, people were saying, hey, you need to sign up. You got to wait six weeks. Then it's going to take me two weeks to edit this. And I'm like, no, this book is done on Tuesday. It's going out on Friday. Let's figure out how to make this happen. And so from that consulting, that manufacturing concept, it was like, okay, how can I do this? Well, if I write the book in 25 chapters, then I'm going to release those chapters to the just in time, JIT, which is very, you know, my background in IT, it's a very understood concept they would actually be editing as I'm writing. So if I wrote chapters six through 10, I would give it to them. I'd go on through 11 to 15. By the time I finished chapter 25, the first 15 to 20 chapters were done. So we just had the last few chapters to finish and get it out. And so that concept has moved forward into our company to where now we do million plus words of editing a month. (laughs) Wow. So, um, it's interesting because you've mentioned intellectual property IP and obviously Judith, um, you know, I've sat with Judith at London Book Fair and, you know, we're going to meet at Frankfurt and we go to these book fairs in order to license intellectual property. And one of the things that concerned me very much with co-writing and, um, for example, I've been pitched around using characters in games and stuff like that. And I've been very concerned about the idea of co-mingling IP, which is mm-hmm. where, you know, universes can cross over and the IP owner owners um, may be in dispute potentially. So I'm really interested in how your ideas around IP work when you've got a universe, which you may have created, and lots mm-hmm. of other people who've written in there who have slices of IP, um, given how fast you guys are growing, you know, what are your thoughts around licensing, commingling, and any other exciting things? So as the, so, let's take it as you're the universe owner. People and, and um, other authors are coming to you for an opportunity. That opportunity doesn't necessarily mean 
I'm going to take my piece of the IP and go. No, when they came into Cthulhu and Gambit, I was very upfront. This is my universe. Let's be very clear about that. I own it. I'm going to run it. Now, I'm going to, because I'm quote unquote a nice guy, if you're not in the universe and you're not writing in it anymore, because my thought was always people would come into the universe, they would write, and they would leave. The benefit for them, of course, is they understand how we do things better, which was very obvious for a few of my collaborators. They're, they were writing the stories not because they were engaged with the universe. It's because they wanted the opportunity to learn. So no different than a blacksmith, you know, a trade. Mm. And, this, and the rules at that time were, hey, I'll ask you, but if you're not getting with me or anything, I have the ultimate ability to say we're using that character you created in this other story. I don't think I've ever done it in the last three years. Um, but there, there was one time I needed to ask them and say, hey, we, we need to use this character. Are you good with that? And they were off doing something else. So that's one where you own the universe. And then you have co-owned universes. And so you have to be understanding, and, and you know, where's the bifurcation of responsibility? And in Ora Saren, I set up Martha as the one who is running that universe. However, I'm the one with, with the the higher level of skill, the understanding of what's going on. So Martha came at it with, you know, yes, I'm running this, but Mike's the one who understands how to make this part successful. So that is a relationships issue. If we're looking at something brand new, which we do now, and people are asking me to be a part of it, then we're like, okay, how are we going to do X, Y, Z? And we set the collaboration up in such a way that no matter what we sell, whether it be um, ebooks, paperback, audio rights, if it should go to TV or movies, the percentage is the same. So uh, in the Cretherian, for example, we sell audio rights. Sometimes the collaborators are aware of it when I'm saying, we just sold this, you're going to get a check for X. Mm. And they might, you know, might not have been a part of it for a year or two. And, you know, that's happened. And so um, when it comes to your personal stuff, you own it. That's it. They don't have to work with you. If they don't like that understanding, that's okay. You part friends and maybe you do something else. Now, if you go to the one where someone wants to come work with you because they understand your mystery thriller capabilities, they need to make it worth your while. You're Joanna Penn in this case, or you're, you know, Fred Smith or whoever you are. They're coming to you for a reason. Understand what that is and just be good with it. Mm. Yeah, and I I like how serious this topic is because it is serious. What you're creating here, I mean, um, as as we speak, uh, Disney is about you know is launching their streaming service. Mm -hmm. um, Apple has just launched theirs. Obviously, Netflix. Obviously, everyone else uh, doing this. Everyone's looking for big universes. So this is why this is important. And I want to encourage authors, whether they're working with you or another publisher. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have to be aware of the value of what we create and make sure our contracts um, portray that. So I love that you're very serious about contractuals and IP and um, that you and Judith, uh, you know, I saw the documentation she was taking around London Book Fair and it was hell of oh impressive. Goodness. It was super <laughs> impressive. I was like, OK, I can't even sit next to you with my tiny one page. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about it is, is um, I don't suggest this as a uh, a business strategy, but I married a JD, a Juris Doctorate, so she basically is a lawyer. And uh, when she first saw the contracts I had done for Carthier and Gambit, let's just say that she was duly unimpressed. <laughs> and so she's been working for the last four to six months with Stephen Campbell to move our contracts into the future, so to speak. And so we have them. Um, they, they, you know, one person is like, I work with the publisher with the one page contracts and Judith's response is every single piece that's in there is there because somebody needed it. So if you have a question and let's talk about it and she's very straightforward, but it's like, there's something that's there. Recently, we had to put in something we had never considered, which was a moral turpitude clause. Mm. And, and why, so, so why did you do, why did you include that? I can only go into some vague stuff, but mm. somebody got in trouble with a law and we didn't have any way for us to be able to step out of that contract. <laughs> ah, okay. And um, which is interesting because the moral standard thing has come up with a lot of traditional publishers. Um, which essentially you are now. Yeah, I mean, you basically yeah, yeah you you're, so are you saying now that you are a traditional publishing company and that's basically what you are? I talk we were talking with Publishers Weekly yesterday and I was asking um Kevin over there 
what would he call us? You know, what would he call a company such as ours? Because we we're always indie, right? That's what I grew up, so to speak. And he goes, well, we might call you independent publisher, mm. but since we still create our own IP, we still build our own universes. We have just now started because we built such an infrastructure. It's kind of like Amazon when they had warehouses and they're like, hey, you know, we could just rent out some of this capability or Oz as, a, as another one. And so we looked at it and we said, OK, why don't we use some of our infrastructure to help and you know bring other IP? It doesn't always have to be something we do in house. So. Um, you know what? I lost the. I lost. Yeah, it, well, the question, I guess, because at the moment with that um, backlist, what do you say? Six hundred titles, two hundred audio. Mm -hmm. This is bigger than a lot of uh, independent publishers in the UK and possibly in the USA as well. Um, you mm -hmm. know, LMBPN is actually a big independent publishing house, and the fact that some of those books, you know, you personally wrote um mm -hmm. what was a start but it's it's fascinating to me um that that you're you're growing so fast but i do want to come on to something i'm excited about um mm -hmm. so basically one of my issues um uh, that has been around the 20 books to 50k group um as mm -hmm. you know is that it's been very focused and quite vocal around ku Ebooks, so Kindle Unlimited for people who don't know, or um, exclusivity to Amazon, which I have a lot of issues with, and also the, the focus on, I guess, just the US market. But earlier in 2019, and I did talk about this on the show, you went wide with audio, and now you're launching a new series wide with ebooks as well. So I would love to know mm -hmm. um, what. What has changed? Why Why are you going wide with some books and your thoughts on KU? Well, I don't, I don't know that my thoughts ever have necessarily changed, but it, here's my argument in 2015, which you will remember that as being a big moment in time. My point was I'm making at that time $50,000 a month on Kindle Unlimited. Does somebody and, and somebody is, is mostly going to say it's going to take six to nine months to go wide? And I'm like, okay, so you want me to stop with three hundred to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars to test going wide? That doesn't make good business sense, right? Mm. So it's like, hey, it, they're like, well, it could go down. Well, then I'll have three hundred to four hundred fifty thousand dollars in the bank. I think I can weather it. That was my con. That was my business thought, mm. and to a large degree, it still is. But <laughs> now we come to the butt part, right? So in, in looking at wide, the question or often you hear when people talk about it that, hey, I tried KU. It didn't work for me, but I went wide and it did work. I think both of us can say that we've seen that happen. Is yeah. that yeah, accurate? I mean, okay. Yeah, it works for some books, not for others. Yeah. Exactly. So imagine, if you will, that even though I have um, all the success I could want in Kindle Unlimited, I'm now taking on additional authors who will not fit the KU model. I know that. It's obvious from just watching the history that it's going to happen. Now, the other part of it is in Frankfurt last year, I, I will say it as Judith drug me to a meeting with Zebralation. And um, during this time, I met a lady by the name of Michelle Cobb, who's part of the um, Audio uh, Books Association. And she threw out a figure, a fact, a factoid that I didn't believe. And her comment was, at the time, Audible was 42% of the audio market. And I said, that, that can't be. I just knew that audio was, eight, you know, that Audible was 80% of the market. So I went and researched it. Mm. She was right. <laughs> yeah. Was, it, so, is, was that because mm -hmm. your mindset was so US focused? Um, no, it's, it's more from the fact that everybody called Audible the gorilla. It is the gorilla. It is, and so for me, gorilla, I guess I associated with 80% of the market. I never really tried to go look at the numbers. I never did. Mm. So, you know, like for instance, we're actually not as focused on the U.S. market as perhaps perceived. We get 12% of our income from the U.K. market, which for us is still five figures a month. We get, um, a, we're gr and growing a large percentage of our income from the German translation market and to some degree the German market. You know, so we've tried or we have German translations that are very successful. We've tried Spanish uh, translations, not so successful. That was a good way to learn that mm. uh, sci-fi doesn't necessarily do well in the Spanish market. <laughs> so, <laughs> good tip. But, at the moment, yeah, let's yeah. say at the moment, I'm sure, sure it will change at some point. <laughs> 
Well, it's a fascinating – so I had a um, – and this is completely off topic, so I'll try to do it quickly just to put a bug in your ear. Mm. So America is big in sci-fi. UK is big in sci-fi. Russia is big in sci-fi. And China is just growing amazingly in sci-fi. Mm. But you don't see it much in other places. And it wasn't until we went over to China again this year to the Beijing Book Fair – as we were doing this, I started to realize, because we were uh, meeting some other people at Worldcon, the countries that seem to be really heavy into sci-fi are also the countries that seem to be heavy into space. Ah. German, you know, and others. And I'm wondering, because in for the most part in Latin America, those countries are not space-going countries that I'm aware of. So they don't have the the – excitement, if you will, of the sci-fi or the scientific to, to, to what I can tell. So it's just a, a thought. Yeah. Is well, that I think, the re- well, I, I love that you guys travel and, you know, obviously I'm a big traveler too. I think you can learn so much just from being in another country. And mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Frankfurt Book Fair versus London versus New York versus Beijing, even just the book fairs are so different. But let's, um, coming back to KU, I don't want to leave that topic. So, <laughs> um, so you said some of those authors are not going to work in the KU model. So, um, you know, so I guess. So I went. So I, yeah, right. Yeah. So I decided. So I have, there's a couple of things I want. Um, I have a what I consider a passion project. And that passion project is Opus X. And it's going to it. I knew at the time I started it, I was going to spend a lot of money, too much money on the doing because I wanted some amazing graphics. Now, the other part of it is if I'm going to learn wide. Do I want to learn it on some of my collaborators' time, money, effort, or am I going to learn it on the back of my effort? So I'd rather learn it on the back of my effort because I'm very aware this is going to cost me more than a quarter of a million dollars in lost income to figure out how to do this. I'm not going to put that burden on somebody else. Because so, because you're not going to put it in KU. Correct. Yeah, you're talking 12 books over a million words of – in. in I know what I would make in KU, so I know I'm not going to make it, right? So, And KU, by the way, is around 60 to 70% of the typical income of our uh, series. Right. So, Although I would challenge you on this. You don't know yet what you're going to make wide. That is true. I, I, but I know what I'm not going to make. Yes, that's true. But you can't say it's <laughs> that much lost income because you haven't put them on KU, you you haven't, this is what's so difficult, right? You can never split test this. I know as an IT guy, wouldn't it be great if we could just do it twice? Um, I mean, and the the thing is, I would love to put some books in KU um, because I want to reach that market, but I hate, hate, hate exclusivity. And I think it means there's a whole world, most of the world who you're not reaching with your books. So I think, Mm. I also think that what you gain is a lot more than, you know, you gain a, a, a much bigger audience than just KU, because of course, KU is not available in every country. I don't read KU books. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not in a, a KU reader. So there are lots of people who are not being reached. So that's why I'm excited about you doing this. I, and I can understand. I think, you know, off, off recording, I, I'm happy to discuss because I think, you know, the question can be also turned the other way and go, OK, let's talk about India. You know, India does have KU. There are India readers, and India is a horrifically hard market to try to capture because of the cheapness of the paperbacks. Mm. And the fact their distribution models in, in India are so radically different than what we would typically be used to because you can, you know, you would have a in person in India in a, small, in a small town who might buy, quote unquote, a book from a person on a bicycle. And then next week, they'll sell that same book back, you know, kind of like a half price bookstore model. And how are you going to compete in that situation? It's very oh, yeah. difficult. Yeah, well, that, but to me, that is a, case, a technical thing because you can't upload the same book twice on Amazon, and tick different things. You know, that's against their terms of service. So I'm, to- I'm, I'm not arguing about a, a territory like India at all, um, you know, talking about the bigger markets or the libraries, for example. But um, let's come back to you again, not, not me. <laughs> so what, what are your plans? So you've got this, what do you say, 12 books that you're going to drop? Yeah. Are, you, are you dropping them all at once? And what are you going to do with marketing? So we, <clears throat> we understand, LMBP understands that we don't understand wide. It's not been our thing. So we reached out to a lot of the industry um, people that we understand. So Dreamscape 
um, audio and Kobo and Publish Drive and Draft to Digital. And we reached out to everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, and said, hey, can you help us with this? Because we'd like to understand better how to do wide. We'd like to do it right. And we'd like to um, do a white paper and share at 20 Books to 50K to understand how to do this. At least here are our learnings to date. And then we'll do it again. So we, I like to say that I have one story broken up into 12 books. They're going to be released over 18 months. So every six weeks, we are releasing a new book. And it will be in ebook, paperback, and audio simultaneously. And so the rights have all been sold and we're going through there. And so some of the partners have already uh, produced concepts we didn't understand. Like, you know, we're not all that familiar with doing a bunch of pre-orders a year ahead of time. And so Apple is like, hey, we really think you should be doing this. Mm -hmm. And Apple is another one. Um, so, you know, they're giving us a lot of their insights on how to do these. And these are all people, you know. Um, that are advising us every three weeks. And this is something that Judith is doing. So she has this th every three weeks. We do a 30 minute and it's timed. It is 30 minutes that um, we tell everyone what we're doing. If they have any advice, please give it to us and we'll modify what we're doing. And then what we're testing and what we're trying so that if we're trying something new, that they'll get insights into it. Maybe they can proliferate that information up to other people. You know, we're using um, like we're starting with Clark's World, which is a science fiction online website. And we're, we're going to be advertising there. I, I don't know that I've heard of people using it, but you know what? We're going to try. So we'll let everybody know how good it's for us. We've met Neil. Um, and so I think that's going to be good. It's going to be good for us to understand how to get that message out to a much bigger audience. And so, yeah, I have great hopes. I have great expectations. Um, the partners are helping us and it, it very well can be that it is what's needed to take quote unquote, Michael Anderley to the, the next level. Mm, and, th and that's, I guess what I was talking about with opportunity. I also think that having, um, there are just ways that other companies look at KU. That that's mm -hmm. all you know, and you know that's literally how I think it's it happens in some of the industry. And as soon as you kind of put your you do this in a more, I, I won't say more serious financially, because obviously KU is very serious financially, but it's almost like playing on the uh, playing on the playing field that some of the other companies globally play on. It wouldn't surprise me if that then leads to a lot more foreign deals. For example, um, you know, I got deals in South Korea just because they found my books on, um, you know, an Ingram Spark uh, mm -hmm. list uh, because I'm wide with with print for example so mm -hmm. there are things that I think will happen so I mean I, I'm obviously I'm not going to make a bet with you at all but I think that to me the biggest mindset shift is KU is is much quicker money but wide can bring opportunities that might make you much more money so for example you know, maybe this will lead to, you know, getting picked up by Disney. I mean, this, this is, you know, what, that's an interesting, thing. no, I, I can, that was actually to some degree, a, an aspect of my thinking as well. So, um, the, the graphics, have you seen the video that Judith sent you by chance? Yes. I, I had a quick look. Yes. Okay. So you saw the quality of the graphics that, that, that video says, and if you see the covers and everything else, we spent a large amount of money to make this look like a Hollywood style or quality production. Mm. And it isn't, I, I don't have the, the like Hollywood itself doesn't um, turn my head. It's not like I've watched movies my whole life and I'd love to be on, the, on a movie. That's not true. I love books, but I'm not ignorant of watching when Margaret Atwood or, uh, George R. R. Martin, when their stories are either at the movies or on HBO, they rise above me because you get all of that marketing from it. So that's not lost on me. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and Lee Child says that about Jack Reacher, you know, and people say, oh, why did, why did Tom Cruise do, you know, Jack Reacher? He's too short. And Lee Child always says, yeah, and they spent whatever they spent, 300 million or whatever on promoting my brand. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I sold a yes. lot more books. Um, a lot more people have heard of Jack Reacher because of the movie. Um, so I think this is super interesting. Now we we are um, we're almost out of time, but I know people listening. Look, you know, n- neither of us are suggesting that people should be writing twelve books and launching them or spending all this no. money. Like this is not what we're talking about. You are even though you haven't been doing this that many years, you've moved super, super fast. I did want to ask you, do you think that KU has changed um, when you went into that in 2015, 2016, things were different. And because of the uh, overabundance of ads now, you know, things have really changed. So do you still believe in the KU model exactly as it was for other authors? um, Or do you think things are a bit different now? I would have to ask the person specifically what their time frame is. I have one author who's coming on that we're signing and her expectation is to put out a book once every six months. And I told her now she has one in the can, one that she's mostly done in and one that's going to take nine months plus. I said, look, we're going to effectively make you a wide author. That's the plan from the get go. But we are going to take since you have one and two. We'll put those in KU and then we're going to roll them out. And by the time you get to three, it's it's out. It's wide. You mm-hmm. know, because we understand what your timing is and what your intent is. She has a five to 10 year plan. I don't know what's re- the rest of what's in her life, but that's her intent. I'm like, hey, wide is the way that's going to make you the best opportunity here. Because unless you're going to release relatively quickly, I don't think KU is going to be the right choice for you long term. And someone else uh, who I know can write 200,000 words a month. So she can <laughs> either do 200,000 word books or three 70,000 word books. I'd be like, you know what? KU is going to pay you well. So you understand the, the dichotomy between what's going on for them. Now, others, what is their mountain? If they want literary success, I'd probably go wide. I don't think KU is going to benefit you much at all. If you want... Um, Awards, if you want access, you know, when we looked in Spain or we looked in France, we understand that the ebook market is different there for different reasons, right? France is very paper. That, that's what their intent is in the country. So they're almost holding out obstinately. Spain's a little bit different. Um, but from like, let's say if I was going to do it again, once again, I'm going to write fast. Okay, use probably still the, the, the right market to get income fast. But then what is your long-term plan? I'm Mm -hmm. not a big worrier that KU is going to change anytime soon, but I know that it's a possibility. And I want to be a part of uh, Apple. I want to be a part of Google Play to some degree. It's interesting to see what changes they're going to make. Um, And I see that the other countries in 10 years will be somewhere they're not. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so absolutely you know i agree with you yeah yeah, yeah. so what are we going to do you know let's be there because i don't think that the change i don't know that the effort to be wide is ever going to be like hey go wide in three weeks they're going to know who you are without a lot of advertising oh no it's a long-term plan exactly yeah Absolutely. It's a long term plan. Um, Well, I think that is very cool. And um, of course, you know, as you said, you've got 600 plus titles more every month. And so even if KU folded, you just go wide with all of those. So (laughs) you've built built a hell of a backlist. Hey, um, question for you, though, since I have you on the line. Ha ha. Um, (laughs) When you you talk to a lot of people that go, I would imagine, from KU into wide, and I see little little snippets of conversations where people say, yeah, but when I went from KU to wide, what I found is I still received more income from my Amazon sales um, that made up for some of that KU because the people were willing to do it anyway. Yeah. I mean, my own sales, uh, yeah, are still Amazon uh, only. I mean, I think there's a lot to be... I mean, this is a huge conversation and you're not interviewing me, <laughs> but, um, but it's, I think it's a very different reader. That's the other thing. So for example, I don't, I'm not a part of, uh, I mean, I'm part of Audible as a subscriber, but I'm not a K in KU as a reader um, because I buy, I like to buy my books. I will pay, I'll pay £12, £15 for mm-hmm. an ebook. 
that I want. Um, and Apple readers and uh, to some extent, Google Play readers and different countries, their readers on the other platforms are less price sensitive. So often if you're wide, you will have a higher price than you would do um, in KU. Um, and I, I think pricing is a huge deal. Um, but even like something like you mentioned with those Apple pre-orders, if you have 12 books on pre-orders for, you know, they, they you get the double ranking on, on Apple. And in some extent, you get this temperature rising on Kobo and stuff like that. But even just on Apple, like just doing that, you could get sell, not, you know, sell through to pre-orders on all of those books, which is super mm -hmm. exciting. So I think what you're doing, which is a kind of rapid release wide is really interesting. And I'm, I will be fascinated to hear, um, what you learn, uh, along the way. Um, so yeah, very excited. Uh, so we, but we are almost out of time. So tell people where can they find you and your books and LMVPN online? You can now find LMVPN Opus projects uh, wide. I'm happy to announce that, I suppose, um, <laughs> on all the different ones. A lot of our books are obviously still in Amazon. And you can find us at LMBPN, London, Milan, Barcelona, Paris, New York, dot com uh, is where our main website is. And then, of course, you can find us pretty much all over Facebook. <laughs> yes. All right. So thank you for your time, Michael. That was great. Thank you very much, Joanne. It was a pleasure and an honor to be here. So I hope you found the interview with Michael useful today and that it gave you some food for thought about your own author business. So from my perspective, I love talking to Michael because it helped like I have massive respect for the type of ambition that leads people to grow a company that big but I never want to have a business with employees and all those co-writers and all of those different things like that's just not the ambition that I have. I have a creative ambition for sure about the books I want to write and I have a certain amount of financial ambition. I mean, I love making good money and I, I do make good money. But first of all, I love my independence and and I'm a creator first, I guess. You know, I'm I will always favor creation over other things. <laughs> so yeah, and I definitely don't want to manage people or other authors. <laughs> I love you all, but I don't want to manage you. <laughs> so um but I really enjoyed talking to Michael and in terms of publishing wide I hope Michael will come back in a year's time to discuss how the experiment has gone and lessons learned because he and wonderful uh, wife and business partner Judith are getting a lot of help from everyone in the community who wants obviously to see them succeed, but also because they have bigger budget, bigger series, they can experiment with things that most of us can't, including myself. So I'm very interested to learn from their wide experiment. So next week, I'm talking about how to be a free range human with Marianne Cantwell, uh, all about how you can run a business that suits your personality. And in fact, Marianne's a very, very different person to Michael. So it's a great counterpoint to Michael's journey. So join me next week for that interview. Happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.